focuses mostly on developing and controlling multi-robot systems, uh, ranging from soft robotics to design composition and also to modular robotics. Today I'm gonna talk about Sorry, that's okay. Today I'm gonna talk about two projects, the printable programmable machines project as well as the MBLOX uh, modular robotics project. So the first project, the printable programmable machines the vision of this, as Daniela says, is essentially one robot for child and one robot for household. And so the challenge is that designing robots right now is incredibly difficult. It involves integration of mechanical systems, electrical systems, firmware systems, as well as a control architecture. And so right now that requires teams of dedicated people and her vision is to essentially condense the essence of that into algorithms uh, that can sort of automate some of that development and allow for people that are non-expert users to sort of find a task and develop a robot system to, to help address that task. And so sort of her goal is to have the robo kinkos where you can go, you can go with an idea and you can get a robot developed or you can use these tools uh, at your own lab or your own house to develop robots. So some of the specific challenges that we're looking at this project is the first is develop automated uh, design tools. And so these include tools to develop both the overall mechanical design of the module as well as the electrical connections, the software that goes on the microprocessors as well as the system to control and interact with the robots. And so the goal is to sort of tie these all together and even if it's not the optimal uh, perfectly developed robot, if we can tie enough of them together, we can still make useful functional systems. The second goal is to sort of develop actual hardware systems. Along this lines, we've developed uh, several methods of producing these robots, and the first uh, uses folding. We're also looking at 3D printing, and the benefit of folding is that you can develop it using very cheap equipment, for example, a laser cutter, or if you don't have the funds for a laser cutter, you can use a vinyl cutter, and you can even develop some of these systems with a uh, solid ink printer, a razor blade, and a ruler, and so our goal is to sort of allow development of, of systems across this whole range of uh, production capabilities. And the third goal is to develop accessible, to make these tools accessible for educational outreach as well as for anybody that is interested in developing these and also to sort of share this with the community in hopes that people will develop it with us. So here's some examples of some of the robots we built. Uh, this is the, the fetch insect, which I think Rob Wood mentioned yesterday as well as uh, on the left, or on the right, there's a sort of a similar robot, but it's built on a 3D printer with folds integrated into it. And also, we are working on sort of computational folding, and Eric Demain, which is collaborating with us, will hopefully talk a lot, a lot more about that shortly. But I think the best way to show this is, so our vision is to demonstrate show this video uh, from Joe Del Prado and Anker Meadow, who are my colleagues, which sort of goes through the process that we hope uh, will involve the creation of these robots. So essentially, we hope to build a library of both mechanical, electrical, and software elements, and then sort of create an interface where you can choose, pick and place which components you want in your module, in your robot, in order to accomplish a specific task. And so here you can see we're trying to create a walking robot. Maybe this will walk around the house and play with, play with your cat, or it maybe will uh, explore environments to find uh, hazards such as you know, leaks of gas or uh, similar things. And so here you can see it right now, we're sort of, we're at the level where we, we can assemble these uh, simple components such as legs, bodies, uh, wheels, and then we have, this shows the process, three different options for making it. There's a vinyl cutter, a laser cutter, and uh, using a manual razor blade. And so right now there, there's a decent amount of assembly required. So it's, uh, as you can see, these are sped up quite significantly. But the end result are functional robots that have all of the important elements from, from the, the hardware to the control software. And right now we're looking, we're focusing on using Arduino, but we're, we're hoping to expand to include systems such as ROS and other more complex uh, computational software. And also we're looking to develop ways to control them. Here's an example of using a, uh, an app on a smartphone which sort of generates a controller based on the parameters of the robot. So in this case, there's an arm and it's sort of automatically generated a rep representation of that arm and allows it to be intuitively controlled. And in a, the other two panes show sort of driving and walking robots respectively, which are also have a simple way to control 
and are capable of driving around and stuff like that. So uh, the next project I want to talk about is the MBlox Modular Robotics Project. And so I would uh, talk, explain my vision in words, but this video does a much better job. So this is a, uh, we did not make this, this is from an Indian movie called Ra One. And we just, we love this video because it, it like almost directly shows our vision of this project. And so the, you can see these small modules, they come together, they, so they move independently. And so the essence of, the, of our goal here is to make lots of small modular robots that can come together and build either a structure or a larger robot. And so in this case, uh, they obviously have access to far more advanced technology than we do, <laughs> but it, it definitely shows uh, sort of in 20 or 30 years what we would like to accomplish. And so why do we not have this right now? And so there, there besides the fact that it involves magical technology, there are many practical difficulties. For example, the, anybody that's worked with uh, modular robotic systems will recognize that uh, the connectors are a very serious problem. There are many different factors you have to consider. For example, electrical connections, mechanical connections, torques, forces, and they also have to be robust and lightweight in order to not uh, sort of overwhelm the rest of the robot with the connecting system. There also has to be a framework to allow these modules to reconfigure. And this, is, this has to be general enough so that the modules can reconfigure generally, but also doesn't take too much of the hardware. And there are also many physical constraints. For example, you have to fit all of these different components into a small volume without making the whole system too large. And this, this becomes a very challenging problem because you have to sort of get it right from the start or it's just you're just piling things into a little box and you just can't fit any more things and then it gets very limited. Also, the cost is a very serious issue. Any of these systems that people propose, the modules cost hundreds of dollars, if not more. And if we want to actually have systems of thousands or tens of thousands of modules, the cost quickly becomes very prohibitive. One of the other very serious challenges is how to control these systems. If you had 100 modules or 1,000 modules, actually effectively controlling them becomes very challenging. For example, if you can control, one person can control a robotic car, a robotic arm, but controlling 30 or 100 modules becomes completely intractable. So we have to develop algorithms which are able to do this. So in the history of the, the field of modular robotics, there's a whole list of, of different systems people have developed. And there, there's some awesome systems out there if you're interested in this sort of work. There are a lot of great overview papers. Some of the systems that are currently being developed that we're aware of are the Roombots and the uh, S'mores system at the University of Pennsylvania. The, a lot of their systems were, some of the work in this field dates back to the 1980s. And so there's sort of a renewed interest in it. And so we're presenting the new and improved MBlox module. So we've developed this system called the MBlox, and it essentially uses uh, a cubic module which moves based on inertial actuation, and it uses a permanent magnet system in order to locate and connect. And so this, our upgraded system allows movement in all three uh, planes, X, Y, and Z. And it does this by having a sort of a central unit and then a frame. The central unit can pivot inside the frame in order to orient the inertial actuator onto all three different planes. So here you can see it's sort of moving in uh, arbitrary directions on a lattice. And so they, they, the modules can move in almost any lattice configuration to almost any other configuration. Here it can move where it's surrounded by multiple modules on each face. It can climb straight up walls built out of the other modules. Uh, they're able to sort of traverse horizontally. They can even traverse upside down. And we've also, so the, the accuracy of the moves, like some of the moves are more difficult than others, but the easy ones work almost 100% of the time. And we're also developing coordinated motion. So you can see here that if you have, we can sort of move whole lines of modules at once, and we can also move assemblies of modules uh, alone. And also some of the fun aspects of this, because we use inertial actuation, we can get sort of jumping. And so here it's the modules trying to jump across a canyon to find its, uh, its friend on the other side. Here's some more details about the system. So we have a six direction inertial actuator inside of a frame, which includes an array of sensors. We have uh, ambient light sensors, infrared sensors, and inertial uh, measurement sensors. So we've designed this for sort of mass production. A lot of the parts are injection moldable. 
and there is a very small number of new moving parts, between 10 moving parts and three actuators, which is a motor, uh, shape memory alloy wire, and a solenoid. So there are no complex small parts like gears, which really helps uh, make the system more reliable. So what specifically makes these different than all the other systems you've seen? So we, we feel like the, the most important, one of the most important aspects is that we can move a module without any coordination uh, with other modules. And so we certainly can coordinate, but almost all the other systems require direct uh, sort of choreography between two modules in order to move, and this greatly complicates the control because you have to have a sort of a complex system to deal with that. But our system, they can, a single module can just move on an inert lattice or it can move uh, with communicate, also with communication. Also uses fewer actuators and moving parts in many similar systems. And we have the robust ability to move on the ground, such as in the raw one example, they were rolling on the ground. We can do essentially exactly that just by spinning the inertial actuator. So there's some details about how the system works. And so the, one of the primary aspects is the, the magnetic bonding system. And so we accomplish this primarily with these 24 uh, diametrically magnetized rare earth magnets, which are every edge of the cube has two magnets and they're held in cages. So they're able to, to orient themselves in whichever configuration will attract. And so essentially, it's a mechanical hack to get a monopole magnet. And so any edge will connect to any other edge and allow motion and connection through that. We also have different levels of connection systems. We have uh, additional magnets on every face which sort of help connect them. And then we're also looking to the future to develop uh, more permanent connections. So we've embedded uh, sort of a standard nut, uh, an M4 nut on every face where there's four of them. And so eventually we want them to be able to screw themselves together to provide more rigid attachment. Some more details on the inertial actuator. So essentially, uh, this is a reaction wheel. So it's just a spinning, a spinning disc which stores angular momentum and it gets braked by a special brake which uses a belt in a sort of a, it's called a band brake configuration. And it's able to, because of the capstan equation, sort of exponentially self-tightens once the belt contacts the flywheel. It breaks really quickly and generates a very high peak torque. And so you can see on this graph that over a span of about five milliseconds, it generates an average torque of two and a half newton meters. And this is actually almost a thousand watts of instantaneous power transmission. We need this much in order to actually break away uh, from the lattice con uh, configuration and move to the next. In addition to the hardware, we're developing sort of algorithms uh, in order to control these systems. So this is a very challenging field, but there's a lot of existing work that has been developed. And a lot of this work has sort of been developed for systems that didn't exist at the time, and we hope that a lot of this work will be direc directly applicable to these systems, to the M blocks, because we have a more general framework for reconfiguration. And so here you can see uh, a video that my colleagues Cynthia and James Byrne have developed. Which so this is a demonstration of a provable algorithm for reconfiguration of similar uh, pivoting cubes. And so this doesn't consider the sort of the physical dynamics of are these configurations actually possible? For example, some of these, you couldn't quite build a, a line just extending out into space, the, the system would fall over. But in terms of the sort of the, what moves are allowable, this is provable, except that it has some, a few initial conditions which are restricted, which we don't, some very specific configurations which uh, per, sort of create blocks in the system. But if we ignore the, possibility of that, it works. We've also extended this to three dimensions, uh, and I think this requires a few more uh, little kind of caveats of what it's able to do, but in general, it, it sort of applies the 2D algorithm onto every uh, layer in a layer-wise fashion and then converts into a line, and you could reverse that to form into any other shape. And so sort of the more interesting aspect is what is our future vision for this? And so. The primary vision of this is develop sort of a, an ecosystem, a modular ecosystem where different modules can connect together. And this is sort of an artistic rendering of what a future could look like where we have sort of rotational modules, maybe a camera module, and you can sort of grow arms on the spot. Maybe you need to inspect something, you need to assemble additional components. And so hope we would, the goal is to sort of allow uh, by developing additional modules, by developing a connection system that can more permanently connect uh, than magnets, we hope to sort of allow this very flexible, fluid, computer-controlled uh, sort of shape generation of robots. And so we're very excited about, about this, and if anybody else is interested, please come talk to me, uh, and we can hopefully try to work towards this vision together.
So I'm going to thank you to everybody, especially my advisor, Daniela Roos, and all my colleagues at the Distributed Robotics Laboratory. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, our next speaker is Rob McCurdy. Um, he's a p he's also he's a postdoctoral associate also at the Distributed Robotics Lab at MIT. However, the work he's going to present today is from his PhD work at Cornell. Great. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, uh, my name is Rob McCurdy. Um, Hod can't join us today. He's actually doing a talk uh, in Europe right now, so uh, he sends his regards. I'm sure he uh, wishes he could be here. This has been a, a really great uh, talk uh, and, uh, and group. So today I'd like to tell you about uh, the work that I did while I was working with him at Cornell um, that we call multicellular machines. And another way of saying it is basically how do you build robots out of many small modules? So let me first start by talking about uh, some existing really famous and really successful uh, and beautifully designed robots that are uh, currently available. We've seen some previous pictures of Big Dog in the upper left, and we have Atlas. These are both robots which can navigate uh, difficult terrain, uneven terrain. Uh, in the case of Atlas, it can manipulate uh, objects in the environment that are also objects that humans can interact with. PackBot has been really successful. Uh, we have sort of ubiquitous quadcopters and, uh, and rotored uh, aerial vehicles out there, for better and for worse. They're becoming a really important part of, of uh, the robotic ecosystem. And uh, the CMU Snakebot, I think, is a really interesting morphology with some beautiful control work in the series of elastic actuators that go in there. So the observation that I'll make is that these are amazing systems, um, but they also come with a major cost in terms of designing them. So there's a huge amount of specialized domain knowledge that you have to uh, leverage in order to design these systems. Sourcing components, fairly mundane things like that, you become actually an expert when you're a roboticist in sourcing components because you need to have just the right thing for just the right application often. That makes fabrication very slow. You're often building these things in very small volumes, maybe one-offs, et cetera. It's an arbit arbitrary design space, and so wrapping your arms around how you might want to tailor that design space to meet some particular design specification is a really challenging aspect of the process. And I think that that's one of the, the biggest impediments for a new roboticist to get into the field is simply where do you, where do you start? So in summary, it's just a, a huge undertaking. It's a huge, uh, very difficult development effort. So one possible standardization uh, uh, option, rather, is standardization. And so people recognized this about 20 years ago um, in adopting this modular robotics idea. So we have these amazing modular robotic systems which have proliferated. I'm showing some highlights here. The key idea being that you generate one module, you put all your effort into developing one or a few types of modules, and then uh, you tile those things in space, uh, adhering to some kind of topology, whatever it is that they follow. And then maybe you can hopefully build more complex systems out of these individual modules. So um, currently, though, the modules are still fairly expensive, and they're fairly complex, and they're, I think that makes them fairly large. And as a sort of a, an observation, sorry, John, uh, you know, we, we don't have, um, commercial applications of these modules yet. We may in the future, um, but currently we don't have. And so, uh, apart from maybe some, some toy examples, the cubelets, for example. Um, so this kind of motivates me to look at this in a different way. So what if we used a modular robotics framework, but instead of having one module type that had to do lots of different things and suffering all the design complexity that goes along with that, what if we make the modules incredibly simple? So we have a relatively small set of modules that interconnect on a regular lattice, and Neil, this is obviously uh, inspired by all the work that you folks have done. Um, what, what can we do with that, with that kind of system? Um, so the key idea is that these things have a regular lattice, and they also have a standardized interface. So I think those two things might open up the possibility of first distributing all the work. So if I have a designer who becomes an expert in making an actuator, another designer can be an expert in making, I don't know, the, control, the controller for this, uh, the system. These are each individual modules, and so you don't have to become an expert in making every one of the modules. So uh, I'll show a little bit later, I think, how this regular lattice can be used to kind of uh, address the design space issue. But the overall goal is to try to make this a more democratized system, to try to make the system much easier uh, and friendlier to development. So can I see a show of hands who has seen this game? Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> All right, yeah. So uh, this world is this uh, cube-based world uh, Minecraft is the name of the game, and it's sort of the bane of some parents, I'm told. Um, but anyway, 
what I'm showing is a video that I found from YouTube of a couple of guys who have made a uh, dual CPU using Minecraft blocks. I should say that Minecraft was never intended to be used to make CPUs or CPU simulators. So they figured out by using uh, one particular type of block that can pass a signal, and it's not an electrical signal, but it's a signal, and a few other kinds of blocks that they can make all sorts of, of compute engines. So I just show this kind of as a proof uh, by example, I suppose, of what's possible when you have an accurate simulator, uh, excuse me, maybe not accurate, but you have a simulator <laughs> that does something that's fun and, and easy to use. Uh, and you also have um, a design environment that's sort of intuitive that you can kind of wrap your heads around. In this case, uh, a simple uh, voxelized design environment. So this is four minutes long, I'll stop it. But all right, so this brings me to the, the main slide of the talk, M multicellular machines, what I mean, I mean by that. So these are composed of heterogeneous cells. Uh, there are a few classes, and uh, if you'll ask me later how many classes, I have absolutely no idea. Um, they're assembled in very large numbers, so we contemplate millions, potentially billions of these individual cells in an assembly. The arrangement, the rotation uh, and position of each individual cell impacts its behavior in the assembly apart from just the cell type that we have in the assembly. And uh, so, yeah, I think that the cellular arrangement makes it uniquely amenable to design automation. So in the course of my thesis, I developed a couple of different examples of this at two different size scales. And so I have kind of a summary table here that talks about the different cell types and what that could maybe get us to. So if we have structural and sacrificial cells, we can talk about making kinematic structures, soft cells, you can make sort of graded uh, stiffness uh, assemblies. If you throw in logic into the mix, you can make distributed computation and finally sensing actuation and power that kind of gets us maybe toward making uh, a robot. So the smaller size scale I'll tell you about are these three millimeter cells. And these are made using a printed circuit board process. Uh, there are fabs elsewhere. I cut them apart. And they have uh, individual components in the lower left that are mounted on them. So effectively, at this size scale, they're carrier boards. And on the right-hand side, I have a rendering and then the printed um, sort of mock-up of my artist's rendition of what a, a hexapod might look like when you're using these cells to build. So if you're going to build robots, though, the key issue is how do you make the robots move? And actuation at these smaller size scales is a key challenge. The way that I approached that was to use a uh, shape memory alloy, in this case, nitinol. And there's my finger for scale reference. This is a, a flexural actuator that I actually specifically chose to uh, avoid in-plane buckling uh, for various reasons that I won't talk about right now. But um, I make these things in a uh, laminated process in bulk using uh, uh, ultra-fast pulse laser to cut all these bits and pieces apart, and then I use alignment pins to kind of put them all together. But so what this allows me to do is to make actuated structures at these very small size scales. So this is a two degree of freedom robot leg where the tip of the uh, leg is moving, and uh, although it's not moving very much relative to the size of each of these individual blocks, it's actually a fairly large uh, displacement. So the other kind of interesting thing that you can do when you're soldering these things together, uh, and in some cases I'm soldering them together, is to use a low melting point solder. So if you want to recycle all these individual pieces, you just put them into warm water, and uh, voila, they're, they're recycled, and then you can put them back into your assembler and uh, use them again. So switching gears a little bit, I think that there's one immediate application for these blocks apart from robotics, and that's potentially in printed electronics. So Jennifer Lewis's group has done absolutely incredible work in making very high conductivity uh, printable conductors, but I think that there's still some work to be done in the parameters of those conductors. They're still not yet at parity, as I understand it, with uh, bulk metals, copper. Uh, the silver that they use is still potentially a, a cost limitation. And I think more importantly, uh, there are major challenges in the carrier mobilities in printed semiconductors. So we're talking about a factor of 100 to 1,000 difference in the electron and hole mobilities for these printed transistors. And what that means is that the transistors that you fabricate using a printed electronics approach as we are right now is uh, those transistors wind up being really, really um, underperforming. And so instead, what we can do is just use these three millimeter tiles as carrier boards. And by the way, this is just one size scale. It's very easy to scale down this idea using microfabrication. And you can embed the electronics within a piece of semiconductor material or whatever it is that you have. So um, uh, although I'm showing three millimeter size as a reference, keep bear in mind these things can be much, much smaller. So you can connect these tiles together to make uh, non-trivial circuits, although this is a fairly trivial circuit. I'm just showing it as an example. I would say this is maybe not quite as trivial. This is a five-channel infrared remote control that has um, individual 
buttons that control volume and uh, play and fast forward, et cetera. You get kind of a look at how these individual tiles are connected together in this image. Um, so this uses, this particular thing uses 55, 65 modules, uh, five different module types, and indeed it controls a consumer electronic device. I won't show you the, the whole thing. So this is what it looks like when I'm fabricating this. I'm using uh, an object Conex 500, and in a second you'll see me pause the printer and then uh, do some, some things. This is, by the way, sped up 256 times, so this is a painfully slow process, uh, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so here I'm, I'm excavating some of the support material that shouldn't be there, but happens to be because we don't have access to uh, the printer at a low enough level yet. And now I'm placing components, and I'll do this in a layer by layer process. This particular remote control had five different layers. So again, I won't play the whole video, but let me talk about the, uh, the fabrication approach. So um, although I'm doing the manual pick and place and it's really painful, we already have commercially available very high volume pick and place machines. This particular machine can do 20,000 component placements per hour. And we also have laser soldering stations which can do non-contact soldering. So you can imagine combining those three things together, 3D printer with a, with a menu of these individual modules, a high volume pick and place machine and a laser soldering system. And we could today, or maybe in a year or something, have a system that could automatically produce these kinds of, of hybrid printed electronics. I also want to point out that you can make systems that, uh, that are kinematic structures. So this is a 3D printed object that has um, some embedded hinges and a, a kind of a living um, spring. There's an internal contact that makes uh, a switch close, which turns on the LED for the sort of toy grasper so you can see whatever it is you're gripping. The larger size scale is the so-called Biflox material, which is us uh, using a pin and socket connection. And what's nice about that is we can actually exploit those pin and sockets uh, as the pick and place interface. And so in this case, I'm using a commercially available, uh, although it's sort of a hobbyist grade uh, 3D printer, the so-called Fab at Home that we developed in Hodge Lab several years ago to manipulate these objects. And the key point is that because these, these pins are chamfered, they actually self-align. And so the uh, arrangement, and this is one of the key sort of properties of a digital material, the arrangement of these um, pins creates this alignment which is much better than you would normally be able to do with the stock performance of the 3D printer. So you can assemble objects which are more precise than the assembler itself. And so again, this is our friendly uh, uh, infrared remote control. So of course, we're not limited by the number of materials that are in the build space. You can use reels. Uh, these are uh, actually a sort of an adaptation of what you can buy when you buy commercially available components. And so you can draw in more materials into your build volume. Um, in this case, this would allow us to have eight different materials in our palette. So let me switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the design challenges. So this, this design framework that I'm proposing uh, is significantly different from the way that, that we all are, are used to doing design. It also involves a huge number of components. So we're talking about potentially billions of components if we scale down using microfabrication techniques to build these individual modules. Um, because the modules are very simple, it's difficult to sort of reason about how you compose all those different modules together to create more complex, more functional devices. So I think that for this particular application and for many others, you know, design automation is becoming increasingly important as the complexity goes up. So we were inspired by evolutionary um, and developmental processes to try to explore some of those algorithms. I'm showing here an image um, that shows the Drosophila uh, in an early stage of development. And there is a, a chemical gradient which is expressed across the length of this organism. And that concentration of this particular chemical signal helps the individual developing cells to differentiate. So the key idea is that spatial variation translates into morphological uh, differentiation. So we adapted an algorithm from Ken Stanley that, got, that does this very thing. So the inputs are X, Y, and Z position in this voxelized 3D assembly. And the output is the choice of what that voxel will be at that position. So in this particular experiment that I'll show you, we had two different muscle types. They were antiphase, and then we had two different material types, a soft tissue, kind of uh, flexible, and then a more rigid tissue, maybe analogous to what bone would be. And we were rewarding individuals in an evolutionary context for how fast they could move. So we got some really fun results out of this. We were hoping that we would get walkers and gallopers because we know that, that that's a, a strategy that seems to work well in nature. But we also got all kinds of other things uh, and that's kind of one of the amazing things, but it's also a pitfall of these evolutionary techniques, is that you, you get a really nice um, sort of exploration of the achievable design space 
but sometimes it's difficult to tell the system exactly what it is that you want. So it may be that this is a really nice way of kind of automating design discovery and then the, the engineer kind of works in tandem with the system like this to try to um, winnow down those choices to find something that works a little bit better. So um, I should also say that in addition to evolutionary um, computation techniques, you can also use constraint satisfaction to try to determine the positions of these cells within this lattice structure. And so I've been working on that as well with some, some good results. So I'll close by um, talking about the question which everyone asks, how many cell types do you need? And again, my confession is I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I, will, I do want to point out that um, uh, biological evolution also doesn't have any particular rule that it's found. So I want to show you the, the log of the total number of cells in an organism. Uh, so for example, here's a dog, uh, 10 to the 15 uh, cells. And then the number of cell types, different cell types that are in that organism. And so for the dog, it's about 99. But you can see there's huge variation. And um, so we, we really don't know the answer apart from this general trend, which is not a particularly strong trend, but it is a trend that says that the larger you are, the more individual module types you need. So I'll close with that and thank all the people who have contributed to this work. And uh, again, acknowledging DARPA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rob. And our next speaker is Eric Demen, professor of computer science at MIT. Thanks, Athena. And thanks, Skylar, for putting together such an amazing meeting. So many great people here. Um, I am Eric Demain. I uh, am a mathematician, computer scientist, and artist. But my background is on the math computer science side. And I study folding a lot. And I'm always looking for cool applications of folding. And there are lots here that you've already heard about. Um, and I'm particularly inspired in turning the science fiction that I grew up with, like Transformers and Terminators and Replicators, and making them into real things. So that will be my theme for today. Um, this is sort of the goal to make uh, uh, Transformers and T-1000 liquid metal robots. Uh, according to science fiction, these were already invented in 9 million BC. but uh, you have to believe the canon for that. Um, and we've just heard about lots of different modular robotic systems. This is sort of the uh, or one approach to making transforming robots. We'll see a lot today. Uh, these I've just picked out three here. They're each based on a different geometry uh, for being able to reconfigure uh, into arbitrary shapes, maybe pushing and pulling arms, uh, rotating around each other, spinning around each other. And you can prove that each of them is universal, so you can make any convert from any shape to any other shape. Um, and you can even show a stronger result that they're equivalent algorithmically, uh, in that one, of one module, like this one, can simulate this one. And so as long as you develop algorithms for this one model, uh, you can rule them all, so to speak. Uh, and so we developed algorithms to give an arbitrarily complicated shape. Uh, in just a few moves, you can reconfigure it into any other shape you want. So in general, if you have n modules, you only need log n time to reconfigure. So this is almost instantaneous. Uh, of course, this is theoretical, and there are some practical challenges to make it happen. Uh, but this is exciting from a reconfigurable modular robot perspective. Um, as, but you've heard about challenges also for building modular robots. One issue is that each one of the modules needs some kind of power. It'd be nice if you could connect all those modules together into one permanent uh, say one-dimensional chain, uh, and then and we're, transformers do this, uh, so we should try to do it. This is like inspiration from nature. Uh, in, in fact, we are inspired by nature also, uh, who does this at a at a much smaller scale. You know, proteins are essentially permanently connected chain, uh, and then they fold into interesting 3D structures. Uh, and this has already been exploited from a bioengineering perspective of reappropriating DNA strands to fold into desired 2D and 3D shapes. Uh, again, using essentially a one permanently connected strand, folding it into what you want. Uh, and for me, this is based on a mathematical principle called hinge dissection. Uh, so the idea is you have a chain of blocks hinged together, and you want to fold from one shape here, an equilateral triangle, into a square. This is an idea that goes back to 1902. Um, 
and in more modern times, here's sort of the, the chemical interpret or the chemist interpretation, George Whiteside's group uh, built this in a Petri dish, so you start with a square uh, arrangement of blocks here, you add a little salt to this liquid, and it folds itself into the triangle. So uh, this is something you could actually actuate. Uh, and then mathematically, we proved that you can always do this. If you give me any collection of shapes that you want to build, there's one chain of blocks uh, that you can uh, prove folds into each of these shapes without collisions. And it's complicated, uh, but uh, it works, and you can do it in 2D and 3D. Um, and you can design a font around this idea. So we're, uh, as I mentioned, also an artist, so, and so is my dad, Martin Domain, who's here. Uh, and these are letters of the alphabet, you may recognize, but they all have the same area, and they're all made out of uh, 32 right isosceles triangles, which means uh, if you take 128 right isosceles triangles, uh, this one chain can fold into all letters of the alphabet. So it gives you a sense of what, of what you can do. Uh, in 3D, we built the sculpture that you can interact with, you put on the gloves, and you can fold it into anything. Um, and then on the more practical side, the Center Bits for Atoms, uh, we designed a, a, a design procedure for how to take uh, a 2D or a 3D shape you want to build and how to manufacture it out of one universal chain. Of course, you have to preserve volume or uh, mass, I guess, but other than that, uh, you can make anything. And then, we, as uh, Neil mentioned yesterday, we built various robots uh, at different length scales, ranging from the sort of centimeter scale to like the meter scale. Uh, this is a robot Skylar built. Uh, it's how, uh, one of our first collaborations. And in general, if, as long as you build a long enough chain, you can fold into anything you want. Uh, so this is one way to make transformers, more than meets the eye. Uh -huh. Another way to do it, uh, in a similar spirit of taking a one-dimensional thing and folding it into uh, complicated 3D shapes, is balloon twisting. You may have seen this at birthday parties and so on. Uh, but in fact, you can prove that uh, tubes are universal. If you just allow me to twist like into a dog, uh, in fact, you can characterize exactly what 3D shapes you can make, and you can make essentially anything you want. Um, and uh, this, I think, has been underexploited. I don't know of any balloon twisting robots, but I would like to make one. Um, on, on the structural side, uh, the Army in particular has looked a lot at using uh, low pressure inflatable structures to build really strong tents and beams and bridges and things like that. They can handle incredible loads um, with maybe a little bit of uh, twisted metal around it. Uh, uh, but you don't see any twisting of the tube here. Uh, and that limits the kind of complexity of structures you can make. These are all special purpose things. I want to make one tube that can twist into anything. So let me know if you want to help do that. Um, so that's one dimensional strands. What if we uh, go up a dimension, we start with a two dimensional sheet and fold it into something that, of course, is origami. This is a documentary about origami and the art and science of it, if you haven't seen it. Origami is hundreds of years old. Uh, started with very simple things like cranes, but modern origami makes incredibly complicated and detailed shapes. Every year we see things that you wouldn't imagine are possible. Each of these is folded from one square of paper, no cuts. Uh, so, uh, this is made possible by a growing computational understanding of how to fold arbitrary things. Here is one such method called Orgamizer. It's free software. Uh, you give it an arbitrary 3D model like Stanford Bunny. It gives you a crease pattern, solid lines are mountains, dashed lines are valleys. Uh, you fold it, it takes about 10 hours. You get exactly <laughs> the bunny you asked for. Um, and you don't have to do that just with paper. You can fold, for example, th this is a sheet of steel that was laser cut at, uh, by the half a kilowatt laser uh, in Neil's lab. Um, and it, this also took about 10 hours. And we cut out some holes uh, to uh, deal with the thickness of the material. But in the end, you get your Stanford bunny again out of steel. So uh, any sheet of material that can hold a crease, you can fold it into anything you want. Um, now. As you see, folding by yourself is really tedious. You need expertise. Uh, and we've heard a lot, especially yesterday, about different approaches to self-folding. Um, this is just some of the work I've been involved in for uh, printable robots, where the robot self-assembles. And then once it's assembled, you're done, and you want it to, uh, to make the thing. Or uh, this came out of the DARPA pr uh, Programmable Matter program. So thanks, DARPA, again. Um, <laughs> 
the theme of this conference. Uh, this was, the idea is one sheet that could fold into arbitrary shapes. So like the universality of the string robot, here we get universality of a single crease pattern. Depending on which creases you turn on, you can prove it folds into anything. Um, another way to do uh, self-folding is pop-up books and pop-up cards. And Rob Wood talked about this idea. Um, there's, you can get really interesting mechanisms and also very complicated geometries uh, relatively simply through pop-ups. And the, the central idea is to get ev all of the parts connected to one hinge. And so with a single actuation of opening that book or closing the book, you get these complicated geometries and actions. And we just uh, developed a, an algorithm to design such things. Um, say in two dimensions, you give me any polygon and I'm gonna add in all of these internal structures, a little bit complicated. Uh, but then everything is linked together. So you just open or close this book and everything collapses and guaranteed no collisions and no ambiguities. And in 3D, uh, we can make orthogonal polyhedra. So quite a bit more complicated than pop-up cards have been done before. Um, this is hopefully just the beginning. We'd like to apply it to the kinds of pop-up CAD stuff that Rob Wood showed uh, yesterday where here he's making a RoboBee uh, just by starting with uh, flat laminate and then using a single degree of freedom to actuate it into the 3D structure and then cutting away the extra bits. Uh, another kind of uh, origami folding is with curved creases. This is a lot more challenging mathematically. We're still figuring out how it works. Um, this is a sheet of steel that uh, Dukes in particular folded uh, with curved creases. Um, here is Kenny Chung from Center of Bits and Atoms uh, getting it to self-fold. The exciting thing about curved creases, you can add relatively simple crease patterns, and if you can self-fold, you get really complicated 3D geometries. So we'd like to understand curved creases. Um, we've been doing that mostly through sculpture. Um, so trying to figure out what is the design space of what's possible by uh, folding, usually along concentric circular pleats. Uh, these are the pieces that uh, Paola showed yesterday, originally from the Design and the Elastic Mind show, where I first met Skylar. Um, and we've been exploring how to combine multiple components like this together to get really interesting uh, equilibrium geometries. Each of these parts is in, uh, is in equilibrium. The, the, we let them rest until they're, they're happy where they are. Um, and in general, it's a really powerful way to use art and sculpture in order to explore this mathematical problem of how do you design strong self-supporting structures. These are about this tall, so uh, relatively uh, simple material, small bases, you can grow really, or uh, you can design really large and self-supporting structures. Uh, back to center in bits and atoms. Another toy they have is the uh, CT scanner. So this is looking at one of those curved crease sculptures in x-ray while the structure turns on a turntable. Originally, we wanted to do this just to uh, 3D scan, figure out the geometry of what's going on, but I think x-ray videography is the next cool thing. <laughs> I think this is really beautiful. You see, for example, these straight zigzags, which you can't see visually. They only exist in cross-section, because uh, it's curved creases. Um, and my dad and I are also glass blowers, and so we explore how to combine glass blowing with paper folding, in this case, in a kind of a ship in a bottle. Puzzle is, how did you get that big piece of paper inside this glass? Uh, we couldn't do it while it was hot, because the paper would burn. Um, and we also explore how to fold glass like paper. So this is mimicking the same kinds of concentric circular folds, but purely out of glass. Um, and there's a whole world of glass folding that we're just exploring with uh, Peter Hauck, who runs the glass lab at MIT. Um, different ways to do pleats and folds and build totally new structures that glass blowers have never thought about before. Uh, if you want to know more about folding, you can check out this class, on, uh, MIT class, free online videos, or this book you may have heard of. Um, so I want to go down uh, a little bit in scale. Imagine very small structures where we can't touch all the parts. Um, and so for example, suppose you have a little uh, one cell life form and you add some metal to it. And I would really love to add remote steering possibilities and then just remote control all these guys, but that's hard. Uh, so let's suppose instead I have a bunch of magnets around the perimeter of this uh, vascular network. And all I know is where these guys are originally, and then I turn on some of the magnets and they all move in that direction until they hit an obstacle. And then I turn on a different magnet and they all move in that direction. So this is what we call global control. You can't individually steer the parts, 
uh, but you'd still like to get them to where they're supposed to go. You can model this by a toy called Tilt, uh, where again, you have global control. You have four different inputs you can provide to the system. All the particles move in that way, uh, but still you're able to achieve complex goals like getting the green guy into the center. Um, and it turns out, in fact, you can build a computer out of this kind of uh, system where just by global control you can do AND gates, OR gates, and so on. Um, so this is potentially very useful if you can construct obstacles how you want. Here we're reconfiguring the letter A uh, with four moves and very carefully placed obstacles. We can convert them, uh, convert those particles into the letter B. And it's universal, and you can design these with algorithms. Uh, Self-assembly, even smaller, nanoscale uh, parts. Uh, this is a great cartoon by Saul Griffith and colleague. Um, here the idea is if you take Cheerios that are chocolate covered and some that aren't, or maybe they're partially chocolate covered and partially not, uh, and you, you can get them to self-assemble into cool arrangements and maybe eventually build terminators, that's the goal. Um, so uh, this typically in reality, this is done with DNA tiles. You get a few strands uh, to lock together and have some sticky bits uh, off the ends and they can assemble into lattices. But more interesting is if you get them to only bind in certain situations and cooperatively bind, you can build arbitrary computation. I think someone mentioned this model uh, yesterday. Uh, so here, this is building a binary counter, but in fact, you can do any computation and build a shape as you're computing. Um, and this is really tiny, right, 50 nanometer scale. Uh, and on the theory side, so the practice isn't quite here yet, but on the theory side, we can build the replicator. We can make any shape you want with a polylogarithmic amount of time. Uh, you just take your arbitrary 3D cube uh, shape, scale it by a factor of six. Uh, we just need 20 different types of DNA strands, and you're done. Uh, so that would build the Star Trek replicator. We also have a way to uh, build a photocopier, um, different kind of replication, where I give you a 3D geometry. Maybe you don't know how it works. Maybe you can't even scan it. Uh, but in, you can still add to that shape a fixed set of tiles, and it will build uh, infinitely many copies of that shape, and then you can take over the world. Uh, so with that, uh, science fiction to science through folding. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, and now welcome Simon Kim and Mariana Ibanez. Simon is an assistant professor of architecture at UPenn, director of the Immersive Kinematics Research Group. Mariana is associate professor at Harvard, uh, of architecture at Harvard GSD, and also they both are co-principals at IK Studio. Many thanks. Uh, to Skyler, and it's always uh, a unique pleasure to come back to MIT. It's one part wow and one part I'm not sure what I just saw. <laughs> so our talk today is uh, called the Immersive because we want to um, locate where we are in this panel with um, the kind of uh, research that we've been producing here at Yale and also at, sorry, at Harvard, Yale, and at UPenn. Is this one going next? Sorry, please bear with me. Um, while we're doing this, though, I'll sort of get into the reason why we're um, presenting the way we are. The, the work that we do as architects, I always consistently have to frame with Mariana that we're working in one part, the humanities. Um, Keep going with that slide. And that while we're working with you, and we gladly work with engineers, we gladly work with dancers, with um, uh, economists, if they ever wanted to come and meet us, is to produce a domain of research that is greater than us, but it also becomes part of us, so that architects are not simply ones who are just turning form for you, but it also is the production of culture. Okay. So um, I would say that there is one unique kind of <coughs> unicorn figure in our zoology. That would be Buckminster Fuller, where he's happily adapting what he's doing in design and kind of uh, 
even one-offs until where, where he starts to break it up into where it becomes universal and he can switch back and forth between design and also being uh, the sort of a, uh, not pseudoscience, but something that is near to it where he can start to uh, replicate, where he can start to um, uh, make predictive. So this is one of the ways in which we engage with our own historical context. We create a document like this, which we call the map of the world for every project to try to understand how they're situated within specific lineages. So in this case, this is just a hundred year timeline uh, to understand how uh, disciplines um, and projects both within and from outside of architecture are influencing what we're doing. So for example, when we make a robot, we don't call ourselves roboticists, but we understand that this technology is available to us to uh, produce an advanced architectural idea. And because I just uh, in the beginning mentioned that we were in the humanities, please bear with me while I show you five slides of an alternative history of architecture. So for those of you that expect architecture to have uh, elevators and to have um, you know, uh, boiler rooms, uh, please be ready to accept that this is also architecture. So if I can read this, today for the first time in the history of mankind, at this moment, and this is in 1967, uh, uh, with the developed science and perfected technology offered the means, we are building what we want, making an architecture that is not determined by technique, but that uses technique, a pure, absolute architecture. Uh, this is um, uh, the work of Hans Holein with his partner at the time, Walter Pichler, where they can even reduce it down to where it is in inside you, it is a psychotropic drug that you may ingest, or it's an aerosol that you can spray architecture. And of course then this uh, other Viennese group at the same time were dealing with um, how to build it bigger, so they were working with uh, plastics, right? So they were trying to expand beyond just uh, static, uh, static uh, kind of uh, inert geometries, but one that can be inflatable, one that can grow, move, uh, turn, until this one, which was kind of the apogee where I would say the EAT group from New York built the 1970s Pepsi Pavilion. And you can see the kind of encrustation, just the layering and layering of every, every kind of uh, technique they can apply to just sort of uh, give you this uh, uh, headache. You know, like you no know, hard shell that's then coated in fog that then has laser beams that touch it at four specific points um, with then these roving, uh, moving, um, robots on this plinth that just sort of jog back and forth. Well, if you squint your eyes, it kind of looks like a Terminator. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, back to Buckminster Fuller with his geodesic dome that covers uh, Midtown Manhattan. I'm not sure why Soho isn't part of it, but um, that's where he is. So um, I have to say that after seeing the previous presentations, I'm suffering from a little bit of uh, robot envy, but we do prototype a lot. And for us, coming from the field of architecture, uh, we, scale is a big issue in architecture. Everything is like a representation of something else. And some of the ideas that we're interested in, as many of you uh, face within your own uh, fields, are really not scalable. So we build prototypes, and uh, these prototypes are uh, part architecture and part knowledge that we're developing, again, from other places. And um, in order to argue that these are one-to-one, -one, uh, we also operate from the scale of the wearable, assuming that uh, the relationship between our bodies and our environment is also um, one of the ways in which we can study architecture. So in this particular project, uh, we were looking at translocation. And this is uh, the anniversary of John Cage the, when he turned 100. That was two years ago. We pitched it to the PMA, which was doing a large retrospective. It unfortunately didn't go through, but it didn't deter us from showing it to you today. So I like the idea of whispering your secrets no, so that you, there's uh, one cabin that is perhaps in the Tate and another one that is in the uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, and that the whispering of one thing is anonymous and immediately transferred to, the, to its brother or its network sister in another city. So there is a listener, and then there can be also a kind of a, the Roman Catholic, uh, you know, uh, you're okay with me. So you can have sort of inside, uh, so that there can be maybe even mod you know, many modules of this uh, around the world. So this idea of these modular pieces is then uh, repeated in quite a lot of our work so that there's like these, uh, they're not modular robots that we'll get to that next, but they are kind of characters that share uh, behavior and that they can influence each other. But another um, ambitious desire is uh, this idea of operating from the nano to the planetary. As architects uh, tend to do, I think the nano and the planetary are understood differently than in science here. What you see on the screen is a project that tries to connect 
what happens at interventions at the architectural scale with behaviors uh, in the city. So again, these prototypes are a means for us to understand how digital behaviors uh, behave uh, in the analog world and vice versa. So in this case, with these series of architectural markers that are uh, loaded with um, um, sensors and the capacity to um, accumulate data, in a sense, they can reconfigure the cognitive map of a city. So we're in this case, we're not talking about physical reconfiguration, but the way we understand through architectural icons the relationships between different spaces. In this slide, um, we do computer programming because there's a lot of multi-agent systems that we employ to sort of help us with these characters and how they, uh, they look for each other or how they're always um, trying to figure out where they are vis-a-vis -vis where others are. Uh, there is something like Grasshopper and there's also something like uh, Maximus P, the jitter, uh, but we communicate through graphics. That is what architects do. We don't build, neither do we really program. We communicate to each other knowledge that is graphical. Uh, so for us, when Marianne and I talk about behaviors, we draw them like this. So that when we, when I badly try to program and somebody else helps us, um, we start this way. So that when there's this choreography, and these are the two kind of uh, more modular things now that you see in the bottom, the way they are moving and then the way that they are uh, kind of choreographed have not just the um, robust, does this system work well, but also the added, what does this mean for us as a, as a human culture? So that when we have these collections and then they can be employed to again, uh, this time at DC, is to uh, start to shift perceptions of where uh, spaces yeah, and where the cities can, um, can be carved up. Uh, this is a fixed linkage system that is the underlying driver of the rapid change going on in the map beyond, and how with these simple motions of these boxes that you can completely, uh, radically change the perception of a city. Mark Yim is the co-director of the research group that I lead of Immersive Kinematics, and he and I um, <laughs> were we're good friends, but we're also tenuous allies because when I talk about design and when he talks about design, um, there's clearly separation, but also enough shared domain. Maybe because I came here to MIT and I spent two years that I can speak with him about certain things that he will understand. So when he shows me the things that he's doing, such as a, 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 a system that can build furniture or can build whatever, actually, I will look at it and say, how can it become uh, better? Not that the CK modules that he makes aren't cool, but they are not really, for me, stunningly uh, beautiful. I know he's listening or perhaps watching this. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so this would be the chair that comes out of that system. And you might be asking yourself, how do you get from there to there? I, um, magic. Um, this is some slides. He asked me actually not to show you, not because it's not surprising, it's super surprising for DARPA, but um, it's also something loaded that he doesn't want to have public just yet. Anyways, continuing on this idea that um, in the work that we've been doing uh, in collaboration with Mark Kim and, and the Immersive Kinematics Group is that um, um, th we have like two ways uh, of developing projects. Sometimes we will come across a product or a certain behavior and we think, well, this could be very interesting within um, one of our projects. And this was the case. Uh, we do a lot of testing within the performing arts and event spaces because of the time-based condition and because it allows us to test things faster than what the world of architecture can do for you. So this was a, also a collaboration with a uh, dance. <laughs> Uh, to these arms to uh, determine a very um, sort of simple environment. The final piece was actually four posts determining the corners of a room, but these elements were also the non-human ag agents in the piece. So during the piece, they will sort of shift from being non-human dancers to being um, um, a, a little space for them to dance within. Uh, so this was, uh, this was actually one of our prototypes. In the end, the arms did not have three segments, they had two. As you all know, we ran into all sorts of difficulties with the actuation, the control, and of course everything worked two minutes before the performance. Uh, but you know, the demo happened. Mm -hmm. Then uh, following up with this one, um, 
Um, this is another way in which we start working. We create these prototypes. In this case, they're these kinetic tetrahedrons that can reconfigure to form a number of shapes. They're not going from any pure shape to any other particular pure shape, but it allows us to expand the surface area that we cover, to grow vertically. Uh, the way that we test these things for us, and I'm sure Paul can speak of that later since many times we torture him uh, with uh, questions or ask for advice, uh, is basically can this support weight? Can this uh, not fall and land on anybody's head and stuff like that? So this was our proposal for the uh, MoMA PS1. I think our computer uh, is uh, failing us again. Uh, okay. Uh, the image that you're gonna see afterwards is, we were also working with the uh, DNA hinge dissection and going from a triangle to the square. The, uh, the courtyard in which this um, uh, uh, installation happens every year has a triangular shape. And we were interested the, in the idea of a conventional courtyard, like uh, perhaps a European plaza. So we wanted to transform the triangle into a square and create almost like a colonnade in the context. But this colonnade was gonna be made of uh, these um, kinetic artifacts. So that's sort of our version of this, which I know Eric just uh, showed, but uh, it operates obviously at a much, much, much uh, larger scale. So this was the principle. These are the series of characters that were deployed. Each one of this was coded with behavior. So you could also have a relationship with uh, them in the virtual world so through your um, phones and understand that there was kind of like a history uh, that um, occurred before and after the event for each one of the pieces. So going back to the uh, explicit uh, modular robotics lab. Uh, so Mark and I, we share a lot of time together. We teach together and um, we speak a lot about what he's doing vis-a-vis -vis what I can uh, do with it. So when I first saw these videos, and um, you know, perhaps now, you know, some of you said they're fairly old now, but for me, the first time, it, would, it, it blew my mind simply because I'd never seen a kind of gate that changes like this. And also, my first question to him was then, obviously, can these things become bigger? Why can we not actually be inside them and roll around uneven terrain? And the question comes back simply uh, the square cube problem, which I discovered, and also allometric scale. But that doesn't hinder us from doing, um, uh, to try to find larger um, applications. So here's the power of modular robotics, where you can have a linear uh, occupation. It can be L-shaped, and it can be also uh, very dense, double wide. Now you can make any number of spaces as needed for that time. So we went ahead and started to design these things for him. And so we said, OK, you know, would you accept that it can move like this? And if he says yes, then we'll continue. And then to ultimately to have this uh, piece that came out. Uh, and it was published in Acadia. And you can see the many different ways <coughs> that it can uh, self-fold. And obviously, another problem was how do you wrap such a, a supple uh, moving structure? So we had to figure out some origami techniques. This is perhaps a different kind of project. In a sense, one of our smallest devices, but one of our larger scale environments. We call it the cloud clock. It's a piece that attaches to the body and can, um, it's like a collar and a spine, and it can produce smoke to hide the identity of the uh, wearer if desired. And because the medium is, of course, smoke, it can grow uh, infinitely. So it goes back to these questions of scale that sometimes, you know, the behavior of matter is really. Uh, our, our limitation in terms of how to grow. This leads us to our last project, um, the wearable soft uh, robotics, and uh, the soft that can then not be wearable, but then can scale up. So this is a piece that we just finished for the Opera Philadelphia. It was a pilot project. Uh, so we work quite a lot with culture, with um, uh, mechanical engineering to simply say it's all one domain. It's simply how you use it and the affect that you're trying to go for. So this was uh, the death of Eurydice. So this is the Orpheus opera, and these robotic snakes uh, would bite her, and then she would collapse on stage. And then there was the trick. If the audience looks, there is a, mo uh, a facial recognition software to, to suggest that she doesn't make it from the underworld. You know what? Let's just keep going. <laughs> well, w one of these things, again, in our uh, desire to uh, connect what we do at the device scale or at the small scale with architectural um, ideas is we took not only the idea of the soft robotics, but in this case, the behavior of this particular linear piece, and assuming that we could replicate it and aggregate it and form this sort of kind of lattice and tissue 
uh, what type of environments it would produce that would also be responsive, actually with a very similar behavior to the wearable, but, uh, uh, but with a, diff a different relationship to the body. So what you see in the animation is kind of like this bizarre condition, this field that you can go through that it opens up, is kind of reactive to you. Um, and or perhaps like uh, going back to the um, our kind of hauling references, like this type of kind of condensed environment that uh, is active and you can be within. And um, so this is where we are now. We're uh, figuring out how to create uh, soft robotics with uh, several vessels, several like layers of, um, of of these uh, uh, air chambers. Uh, so if we can define one uh, system, then like the uh, tetrahedron, that we can define many tetra, uh, sorry, polyhedra. So this thing can act, perhaps scale up and uh, start to combine. And uh, this is some of the color testing that we've been doing. Some of the uh, kind of physical models. There was somebody who was showing golf balls yesterday and I feel like you can do better. And this is an actual physical test. Uh, so we're trying to like br make this thing breathe by you know, blowing hard into these balloons, but also lacing it with resin to see, not because we are researchers and we're, f we're finding finite value, but because we're opening up and just looking for it, all possibilities. And with that, uh, thank you for suffering through two uh, machine meltdowns, but I also want to thank the extensive people that have been helping us. Great, thanks. Many thanks. Thank you, Simon and Mariana. And our next speaker is Paul Kasabian. He's a structural engineer at SGH and also a lecturer, lec lecturer in structural engineering at MIT and GSD. I want a second. Boom. Yes, no? Give me a second. Hi. Um, thanks for that. Um, I like the way Simon, um, I'm actually the uh, tortured structure engineer that Mariana referred to uh, in her talk, and, and I like the way that Simon is now making this a bit of a smackdown in terms of <laughs> people. Um, so I'm a structure engineer, and what I tend to work with is quite a large uh, range of scale on, on projects, not as low a scale as some of the mind-blowing stuff I've seen uh, today, um, when I think small scale, we tend to go down to about an inch. We've been talking with John a bit about some work on the envelopes. Um, and that's about as small as, as I've ever worked. And then we tend to go up to sort of chair installation building and larger project. Uh, but what I wanted to cover today was uh, some, um, that's me as a sort of my day job. What I, I also do is working on a joint research project with a guy called Justin Werfel over at the Wies Institute at Harvard. And that's what I really wanted to cover here today. Um, so we're calling it building like termites, um, large scale, meaning the, the large scale I've been referring to, um, bio-inspired robotic construction. Um, so as when we often sort of structural engineers teach structural engineering, we, people often use this uh, bridge, the Mayas uh, Sargonatobal bridge, as a very sort of pure form. It's an amazing arch. It's very, you know, it's very sort of uh, uh, stunning to look at. Um, and but one of the things that's always interested me, I love it. Don't get me wrong, is that it took this formwork structure to build that bridge, right? So someone had to make the thing to make the thing. And that person's totally forgotten. I have no idea who it is, so clearly that's it for that, that dude. But the, <laughs> um, I would say that this is way more complicated, right? And, and the key thing here is that, if I go back, that was there so that the arch bridge could be built and then be fully stable. This piece had to be stable at every single stage of its construction. There wasn't anything there to help this, right? So when you're making something and you're dealing with scale and we're dealing with gravity, wind, seismic forces, the forces that we work at sort of our structure engineering scale, um, how does it stay stable throughout? Um, totally flukily, not planned. Um, I thought I would show you a picture of um, uh, Spaceship Earth um, during construction. You, you guys raised Bucky and so have others. Um, uh, this was uh, fully stable during its construction. Um, if you it's not touching those floors that are inside it. So as it was built all the way around, it supported itself all the way up. The uh, project engineer back in the 80s is actually our CEO of the firm that I work at. 
So this, in case you ever wondered who did it. Um, his name's Glenn. <laughs> um, but so I'm, <laughs> uh, so um, I've always been interested as well on, um, on working with structures that, that you're thinking about either movement that you want to have, which is the uh, bridge up in the UK, um, which opens, and, but that was built entirely off-site and delivered. So that was a sort of simple solution to being um, okay all as well. Um, oh dear, it's tragic. Um, also, Blue Homes was a, a startup, a student of mine actually here at MIT, where they're trying to develop the how do you, how do you, how do you let the building make itself once it's on the site. I'll stop that. So, uh, there's sort of two different ways of thinking on uh, the way that a lot of structures are being made and self-stable. Um, the one on the left is Gramazio Kohler's work, which is amazing as well. Um, but I'd like to think more about the work, um, the work, the, the, <laughs> the uh, nature's effect on the right, because the work on the left is very, is very uh, high-level technological work, but it's, it's centrally controlled um, and, and has to have everything sort of pre-planned in many ways, as opposed to, let's say, um, swarming of birds where they're reacting to local stimuli, right, and their local environmental conditions, which may be continually changing. So it's a very robust approach to trying to achieve something with birds. I'm not expert, flying south, I don't know. Um, if you're a beaver, then it's creating this sort of a dam in some way, right, and uh, without necessarily having um, a fully thought out design, which is actually, you know, what structural engineers and architects tend to do, or at least we think we're doing it until construction starts. So um, collective construction, the sort of terminology that we're showing here is, is simple rules leading to complex behavior, right? Um, that the result emerges from the system's desire and the environmental conditions, those two things, right? We just want an end result. Not necessar necessarily I want an arch bridge, but I want to cross from here to there. That's really the intent. And then as it's going, maybe it's windy, maybe not. So it's gonna have to adapt to that. And then, so there's no blueprint or central storage of information, um, which means it can, it can provide for adaptability and robustness. Um, if you've done construction work at home, but live my life, trust me, when things change and go wrong in construction, everyone just seems to freeze and um, just seems a terrible way to keep thinking about doing things. So this is all bottom up, not top down. Um, so Justin's work, it'll be very clear, this is, this is his work before I started working with him, was on the Tomy's uh, robots that you may well know. Um, so they're creating structures, in this case, predetermined structures, right, out of um, robots that are placing blocks. So a lot of this work was about algorithms on taking those robots and physically placing them in a way that those predetermined structures would be achievable. Um, and <laughs> so the, um, I had a point, right? The, uh, so these are also creating structures that are larger than themselves, right? Which is often the situation that we're in. I'm, I'm doing this other project on sort of 3D printing a concrete, but the part of the difficulties is you have to have something bigger than the thing that you're making. And it'd be rather nice if the, we usually are trying to make things larger than us or larger than the things we're using. And so this work by Justin's been amazing. Um, what, what I started to work with him on, and we, he was interested in this too, it worked out well, was that instead of the structures that he's building originally was, which are these blocks, so they're stackable blocks, so they're always stable, right? I mean, the, the work was all the planning of how to place it, but the structures themselves every stage are intrinsically stable. They're just blocks on top of blocks. What if instead we used um, scaffolding poles, right? Something where there's, um, they're tubular, they're good in bending, shear, torsion. Uh, but, but you can sort of create a, a broader range of structures with those. There's more sort of, uh, things to do. And we set ourselves, there's really two problems in structures, the tower and the bridge, right? That's essentially it, and everything is some combination of the two. So we set ourselves the easier one, because there's no end. Um, so it's the tower. And I, I put this up here, not because this is what we're doing, but this may be how some of you, some of the architects and engineers are typically taught structures, which is you're given this thing that says for a given height, determine the size of the column under self-weight and wind load. Right? That's how these are always set. And it's a messed up sort of way of, of doing it. And I apologize if you, I don't want my fault, but you shouldn't have been taught it that way. I, I always sort of teach structures and think about them as, as the end goal, right? We're trying to get to a situation. What now? 
what are our options, right? Or, or are our options changing? Are the, you know, is it, let's see how else that goes. So what we started to do is, uh, and this is a work in progress, is pull together um, development of some of the SORM algorithm work for the pieces to go up and find their paths. That's really sort of a path problem. And a kind of material structural behavior where we are tracking all of these at the same time. Um, so essentially, as I said, building like termites, what if um, termites could use scaffolding poles? So the way I like to think about this is termites plus the doozer from Fraggle Rock. If you're, I'm a big fan of the show and love the, I watched the doozers, well, everyone else should watch Red the Fraggle. Um, so I'm gonna call them doozites, because uh, I can. And, um, <laughs> and so this is what we think that they might, might, might do if they had this skill. So this image is a good one to conceptualize at least that we're not just pretending, right? Otherwise I wouldn't be involved. Um, but the idea here is to, to physically simulate before we actually go and build, essentially the reason that we do this because it's better than trial and error. Uh, physically simulate you know, actual robots moving up, carrying a scaffolding pole, deciding whether it's safe to go out on the end of a scaffolding pole that may exist, right? Essentially the cantilever condition, is it safe can that cantilever sustain its own weight plus scaffolding pole at the end? If it can, it's going to go. And we've got some other rules like generally it's going to try and build up. Um, and then as it, as it builds up and, uh, oh, I'm jumping ahead. Um, but as it builds up, it's then going to put a, a pole in and come down. So a lesson we learned in about the first week was to choose our algorithms carefully because it may go wrong. So we're giving them this desire to build up. And the rules we said, take your first tube up as high as you can go, because that was our aim, right? Go up. If the joint's okay, um, move to the top of it and then put that pole there. And if it's not, go down and then reinforce. So it was a sort of build or reinforce approach and, and repeat, right? So that seemed to go pretty well. We, we start, and you, I'll show you a little uh, uh, video soon so then you'll start to get the feeling of what's going on. Um, <coughs> uh, from the little sort of red square is where you might get a pole and you go up and you start building in, in the area of the green square. And so it starts to put up these poles and this, this seemed like a good idea and it's not. And um, the, the main reason being is that as you're going up so high, you get a sort of what's called the P delta effect, fancy way of saying it's gonna be wobbly, right? You probably knew that was coming, but essentially it's gonna, it's gonna the, the amount that it deflects gives, a, uh, gives you a higher bending moment than um, uh, to cause it to deflect further, and then, it, and then it runs away with itself. It does not self-stabilize, right? And in fact, as we ran this software and it got to that point where it was on the verge of tipping over, it decided to reinforce um, at the base, which was basically useless, because that's <laughs> not solving the problem um, at all. And the best we could get to at this sort of stage was, was this kind of a tower structure. Clearly, if we, stepping back from it all, wanted to design a tower, we might Eiffel Tower it, maybe, um, or something like that, you know, something wide at the base that kind of comes up towards the top, um, uh, because we step back from the situation, we know that, but that's an incredibly, incredibly difficult thing to have these distributed elements that are going out with an intent to go up to somehow decide to self-coordinate, right? That's the thing we're trying to avoid have happening, because that's not going to be a robust and, and sort of thing that we think will be possible in an easy way. Um, so. So we don't want to do an Eiffel Tower, we want to, we want to see what it's going to generate. And, and these structures are, the one you see on the right, was pretty good, just not great and actually extremely sensitive to any other perturbations that may kick in. If we just gave it an extra of wind, these things suddenly became quite unstable. So um, after that sort of second week, and most of our work since then, has been to think about building in a, what are called really a self-reinforcing manner. So it's not build or reinforce, it's, I don't know what the word is, being build in force. Um, as humans, instead of an Eiffel Tower, this would be a, a classic diagrid, or if you're going around geodesics, right? something that is very con continuous in its form and structure and placement of material, right? But again, this, this, that would be us stepping back from it. So really where we've got to, this is the last thing I'm showing, um, is, is this video where, where you'll see, Cursor blinking, <laughs> great. So this is the plane we're on. We actually got to the point where we have, um, each of these are a doozite, um, and we ha can have multiple going. And so they have a general rule to build up, to build sort of towards a general center, to not get in each other's way, and to have a structure that is stable at every single stage. 
of its construction. And because we've set basic rules, there's also some basic symmetry that starts to kick in that you'll see near the end um, as we pan up and out. So you can see it's tower-ish, but it's not certainly something that we would necessarily sketch to begin with for ourselves. But it, it is a very robust thing that is being built. And of course, different each time we run it, but different wh while still re remaining in the same kind of family. And I'll just let it finish and pan out um, for a nice little uh, simultaneous thing when we saw the earlier snowflake patterns that were coming out um, from the earlier talk. There we go. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, and our last speaker for this session is Marcelo Coelho. He's principal at Marcelo Coelho Studio, and he's the mind behind the interactive budget. <laughs> and hands, and some other. And some other hands, for sure. Do we have a sound for the computer? Cool. All right, awesome. All right, great, can you guys hear me well? Cool. Um, so uh, I'm a designer and I um, graduated from the MIT Media Lab, which is just this building in the building right next to it. Uh, the design work that I do is pretty broad, um, and, and you'll notice it. It's in some ways very strange how those different things kind of come together. Um, but in my mind, there's kind of this big idea of trying to understand how we should represent computation physically. Uh, I, we've been talking a lot about programmable matter and this active materials and what they're going to be able to do in the future. Uh, but in my head, it's still quite not clear what they're going to be able to do and what we're going to do with them once we have it. Um, and if you talk about computers, um, you know the overall idea of a computer is something like this. You know, it's a it's a typewriter attached to a television, and we do all sorts of stuff with this, right? Emails, communication, you know, we design and build things, and so on. But the reality is that that's just the interface. That's not the computer itself. The interface could really be anything. And and once matter becomes programmable, you know, what is it going to be like? Is it, it's going to change color and shape and texture and form? Uh, and how do we know how it's going to behave? And what should it look like? Um, the way that I try to address this question or answer uh, is just through this sort of three-tier uh, methodology or process. Uh, on one end, there's this idea of computational composites, and, and what I mean by that is you basically get some material that exists in the world, like wood or fabric or something or paper, or something that we know and understand, and you embed some electronics into it. So you kind of carry the properties of both worlds. You could make, say, paper that looks and feels like paper, but it behaves like, like electronics. Uh, and then programmable matter is basically what we've been talking about, right? You chop up computers into these little chunks and assemble them together into structures. And digital fabrication to me is just the excuse to do stuff that I can't do in any other way. So let's get a machine to build it for me into I can't build it computationally just by programming it. Uh, and today I'm just going to talk about the programmable matter stuff just because it's more focused to uh, what we're talking right now. Um, so the first project that I did in this area was this um, thing called Space Hogs. Um, it was a commission to design something that would basically change the gallery space. It would redefine the space of, a, of an art gallery. And uh, for me, galleries are super boring, right? They're just like totally white spaces. It's just empty. Uh, and I decided to focus on the air that was inside of the gallery rather than the, the walls or the, or the physical space. Um, and created this big kind of like mirror-like balloons that could behave like gas molecules and just sort of move around uh, and represent what's inside. Uh, and the reality is that instead of actually showing you know, how gas molecules could behave, they were actually just playing out the airflow in the room. You know, when somebody would come in and open the door, they would all sort of rush out to, to leave the room. Uh, and it was really cool to be able to visualize something like that. You know, you could just sort of stand in the room and you'd sort of feel like you're one of those balloons as they'll come and hit you on the back. 
um, and it, it was it, it, there was kind of this immersive experience. And for me, there was like you know this it was the first time that I had built something where I felt like I was part of it, and it was kind of surrounded by this this world of technology. Um, so. Continuing from that, uh, before the balloon, actually, I had a background in film, and everything that I had done up to that point I had been very much screen-based. Um, and uh, halfway through my PhD at the Media Lab, I got this uh, commission and uh, this award, and they asked me, hey, you know, can you build something that you think represents the future of design? Um, and for me, the future of design is this idea that, you know, one day we're going to get a screen and shatter into all those little pixels, spread it into the world, and, and you know, have compete in that way. Um, I mean, this is the basic idea, right? You walk up to a display and you pull some pixels out and you just sort of sprinkle them into stuff. Um, and um, so I'll play this video that we show you. I like the sound a bit louder. about this stuff too is that um, while well we designed the little box itself and its behavior uh, and how it communicated with other boxes, the sort of aggregate behavior is really hard to predict. And not predict in terms of what it can do, but predict in terms of how people are going to use it. Uh, and once you set up a bunch of those, you know, people come up with all sorts of ways of using it. Uh, the one that I just played now is something that I really like, that once you start running your fingers through it, you kind of get the sort of tessellation patterns. It looks a lot like weaving, uh, but it has nothing to do with weaving. This is we're trying to create this crazy weird sound wave and sort of play animations with it. There's a remote control that you can paint it with infrared light and make it animate. Uh, I love this one where you can actually use your body to cover the pixels uh, and you can create this mask. Um, and um, just to keep up with the, with the nerdy side of this conference. Uh, so there's a lot of technology that goes into this stuff, right? And I think it's been pretty amazing for artists and designers in general, like the kinds of things you can do today. Um, the entire project was done in probably about two months. And you can get stuff injection mode in like 15 days and have like thousands of something show up at your door. Um, it's still pretty hard to put stuff together, right? Uh, if you're at MIT, you can get your friends drunk and they'll build stuff for you or buy a lot of pizza. <laughs> uh, so you shouldn't have a really good mission if you do that. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting, too, to think about how, I think, in general, people have used uh, this, this pixels. I was really lucky to show it all over the place. Um, but there's this really cool connection that happens with the body when people are experiencing, right? Like, first, they kind of see it from far away, and it looks like a display. But as you approach, you kind of become immersed into this thing. It sort of takes your entire field of view. Um, and there's kind of this weird, I think, sort of caveman instinct. You know, the first thing that people do is they walk up to it. And they'll draw something pornographic, or you know, they'll write something that probably shouldn't. Stuff that you see like on a bathroom wall. And then after they get over that, then they start writing their names and then start creating more complex things. So in some ways, I feel like it's very much like kind of a form of graffiti, uh, but it has this kind of very digital properties to it. Um, so these are some examples of stuff. Uh, there's the nerdy there. Uh, this is actually a really cool um, example because museums are pretty kind of stale, right, and boring sometimes. You know, you're not really allowed to touch stuff. Um, and in particular with this piece, it doesn't really work, right, because you go to a museum and you're just looking at it and you can't really touch anything. Uh, but in this case, the, the guard who's just hanging out in the corner would just come to people and be like, hey, you should touch it. You should go play with it. Uh, and then people would go and rearrange it and try it out. Um, and in this particular case, there was a group of 10 teachers that came by and with no instructions whatsoever, discovered they could touch pixels and clone colors. And if they held hands, they could clone colors across people. And all of a sudden, there's like 10 of them holding hands and interacting. 
And that was really cool, I thought. You know, like the people are not only interacting with this thing physically, but they also interact with each other physically through this sort of computational material. Um, after this work, I got a commission to do another version of it. And I wanted to do something a little bit different and experiment with things that are not just squares or cubes, right? How about like circular pixels? Things that are maybe more like half toning or like a CRT display. Uh, and part of the reason why it's interesting is that it, the way that you make lines or draw with it is very different, right? So you can make um, sort of vertical lines or horizontal lines like pretty, pretty directly, but not both. Uh, and you can make diagonal lines really well, uh, lines really well, but otherwise kind of you have all this anti-aliasing effect. Um, and what's really weird too is that for some reason people drew dinosaurs with circular pixels. I don't really know why. With the square pixels, you get all these kinds of like uh, space invader type of drawings. Um, super weird. Um, and uh, with this one, we also did the, the kind of painting effect. Um, we, improved, we improved it a lot so they could actually really get this feeling of like painting with light, where you could just sort of move your hand and have them change color. Uh, and also, it's really cool with this one too, is you can actually use your hand to sort of control the light that you're spraying onto them. And uh, this is another project that I did that's not really computational the same way, uh, but it sort of builds upon the same principles. Uh, so this is not a ball, it was a documentary that I did that was directed by Vic Muniz and Juan Rendon. Vic was an artist here, an artist in residence that was supported by CAST and has become a good friend over the years. Uh, so Vic wanted to make an image uh, out of this drawing. This is a drawing that Da Vinci did of a soccer ball. Um, so we started by looking at ways to arrange soccer balls to create an image of the soccer balls. Uh, so this is a pretty kind of random stochastic arrangement. And, and these are just uh, little foam balls that are painted so you could try different things. Uh, ended up going with kind of a more rigid grid uh, just because you could get more definition. It was easier for people to understand it. Uh, Vic uh, drew or created this ball that's like half white, half black with kind of a bit of shading in between, which is great for doing lines because you can sort of flip the ball. Uh, in between the two lines. Uh, and we were really lucky that we had a ton of balls to work with. I had like 10,000 balls, uh, so you could do something really big. Uh, but it was also really hard, right? It's like like just moving those balls around. It's something really insane. Uh, you just take, like anything, you'd be like, hey, let's move that thing over there. And it'd take like half an hour to do it. Uh, and then I read a lot of the software to make this stuff happen. Um, because we have to figure out you know, how big should this image be, where should the balls go exactly, you know, are we really gonna be able to do something with just black and white? Um, and, um, and what's interesting too is that once you do that, then how do you build it, right? How do you go put these balls on the ground? We don't have a machine that can create something that's the size of a soccer field. Um, so I created this little instruction sheet to give to all those volunteers. So it was kind of a little like silly interpretation of the software that I had written that they could look at the lines that are on the ground and know exactly where they had to put the balls. Um, it didn't really work that well, <laughs> be honest. Uh, but this is, this is how we did it. So we, we ended up there, we projected uh, the image that we wanted to create on the, on the grass, on the soccer field, and then we marked it with lines. And we had to do that at night, right? Because you couldn't see it during the day, you couldn't see the projection. Um, and And then after we did that, we then put uh, balls turned one way or the other just to mark the different areas on the ground. Um, yeah, that's how the, mar the, the marking looked. And we actually can't put the, the soccer balls directly on the grass because you kill it. Uh, you basically, I think, prevent it from, from breathing and it just dies. So I had to put these little protective discs. Uh, it took forever. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this is the final. Uh, so Vic then flew the helicopter over it and took shots of the, of the ball. Uh, and it's really cool because when you're working it, it's always kind of this like very stretched out image, right? But as soon as you fly over it, and you're at the same angle that uh, Da Vinci was when he drew that image, you see this thing pop up in 3D, uh, which you really only see in the final photograph. These are the final images. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is kind of sometimes in the art world, but a lot of it sort of ends up in the commercial world just because people come to me and they're like, hey, we like this stuff, can you do it for us? Or can you do some variation of it? Um, so Budweiser saw the pixels in um, the 640 by 480 that I showed earlier, and they wanted to do something for a party. They, I mean, they basically came and said, hey, we love the pixels. 
can we give pixels to people at a party? Uh, which in my mind made no sense whatsoever, right? Why would you want to do that? This thing is made to be on the wall, it's not to be given out to people. Uh, but it turns out that people go to parties to meet people, right? Uh, and you drink Budweiser beer so you can meet even more people, or it makes it easier to meet people. Uh, so then we tried to, to make this, to make beer sort of a tool for people to meet each other and connect. Um, and this is a... For years, we've been making friends in the same way. Can you guys hear this Now, toasting has received an upgrade. Budweiser presents the Buddy Cup. A cup integrated with Facebook. When two people clinked their cups, they became friends. Each person that entered a Bud event would connect their Facebook profile with the cup's chip. So, they just did the same as always, went out drinking Bud and making new friends. Results. Budweiser got closer to consumers, and consumers got closer to each other, and more. Facebook fan numbers went up by 30%. The case received thousands of views on YouTube. Free media impressions across the internet and blogs around the world. Fortunately, there's a great new way to make friends, and like all the best ways, it involves alcohol. Buddy Cup. The more buds, the more friends. There's something, really, there's something really cool about it, right? People are really fascinated by this idea, I think, of trying to make those devices that can connect each other. And because it's beer, it's fun, and it's kind of a party type of technology. Um, and, and I think there was something bigger to me as well in that it was the first time I started thinking about programmable matter as something that could be social, right? There's some, some social component to it that it could allow people to connect with each other and it could serve as a tool for communication, not just for making stuff. Uh, and that's where a like or the um, these little badges come from. That's how it evolved and how it started. Um, have you guys ever seen this before when people go for dinner and you're not allowed to use your phone? So it's basically, a f it's called phone stacking. So you go for dinner, you pile up the phones, and whoever gets their phone first has to pay, for, has to pay the bill. Um, and it's a super anxious thing, right? Because you're like, I don't want to be away from my phone. And then somebody eventually always jumps in first. Um, and, and it's kind of a pretty weird thing, right? Like we're making technology, like, like if you look at things like Facebook and Twitter, these are social technologies that make us not be social at all, right? That make us look at a screen all the time. Uh, and I was thinking more about stuff like this, right? How can we make a technology that make people look at each other and look at something together and that we have like a shared display? Um, so we spent about a year and a half working uh, with Alan, who's probably somewhere in the room here, um, developing this little guy here, which is the circuit board that's on the back of your badge. Um, and it's a Bluetooth module uh, that does some mesh networking stuff. And it's super cool because it's low cost, low power. Uh, the, you, can talk, you can have as many boards talking to as many other boards. Uh, and it can create all kinds of crazy and weird relationships. Um, and the, the basic behavior uh, that you see is, uh, is this kind of matching behavior, right? You can put a profile into your device. Whenever you approach somebody else, you turn green. Um, and it kind of works as an excuse to connect with other people. Uh, this is the kind of a uh, band, a wristband form factor. We also have a beer form factor to keep up with the drinking stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, for th and for this event, we tried to do um, this chemical reaction metaphor, very loose metaphor, uh, where meeting people means you're bonding with them. So uh, if you try to match with somebody, you know that's, that has the same interest, then a bond is formed. Um, and you get this green light. Uh, when a bond's not formed, or it could maybe not be easily formed, you get a red. Um, and you also have this reaction rate metaphor going on, where um, when you get a blue light, it means that not a lot of social activity is happening, so it's pretty boring. And if it's pink, it's OK. And if it's yellow, then it's the party is a lot of movement. People are talking to each other and changing the party a lot. Uh, and as usual, alcohol is a really good social catalyst. It makes people connect a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's it.
Thank you, Marcella. So it's time for our panel discussion. So if you would all want to come to the panel. said in the morning, um, we're going to leave it more to you to generate the discussion. But um, I also have one question seeing all these presentations in a row. I was, it was interesting how you, we went like the smaller scale going to bigger scale, like when it comes to architecture and structures, and then getting in the idea of the body in Marcelo's um, presentation. So I have all this, I don't know if it's exactly a question, but it's a comment that like I'm throwing it. Like when you talk about self-assembly, it's usually about making the, the matter activate itself. But then in these presentations, we had this, um, we saw how the aspect of human and the body comes in the idea of activation. So I'm just throwing it. <laughs> I'll leave you like for comments, like how, how you can consider the body as a unit of assembly or is it the body that activates the matter or, you know, it's just something to think of. <laughs> I have a kind of sci-fi question for Mar Marcella. I have a okay. Marcella question. <laughs> okay, <It's laughs> me great. first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, f I feel like when we work with all of our gadgets and things in, in the world, uh, it's very hard to like say transfer a file from my phone to my laptop. Can we can we use your like uh, communicating through the body thing to? So you know, if I want to project uh, my slides to the projector, then we have to hold hands to connect my laptop to the projector, and then they send a message, and then they figure out how to communicate. I guess you could, yeah, potentially <laughs> one day. <laughs> I think it would be fun. Um, yeah, my, my sci-fi question for you, actually, I was, I thought Terminator was a bad guy. <laughs> so why does everybody want to recreate the Terminator? Because <laughs> he's so cool, <laughs> you know. Isn't there we, like a We better? all secretly <laughs> want to take over the world. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I guess it's the sad, uh, it's the whole genre of sci-fi, right? The, the apocalypse and the <laughs> negative consequences of technology, but. I think what, what we all s do want is like a gadget that you push a button and it unfolds and becomes something else, right? The sort of, you, instead of bringing several gadgets on your person, you have one thing that can fold into anything. Uh, so that's, this, that's the cool thing about the Terminator, although he was evil. Uh, you know, when he got shot by a bullet, he could just <laughs> rearrange around the bullet and it wasn't Should a big deal. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I guess there's kind of a follow-up question to that, which I think is, what would you like to do with this stuff then? You know, like if you had if you had programmable matter today, it came in this mm -hmm. bottle, and you could do something with it. What would, what do you think you would do? Drink it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I guess for everybody too. The answers, um, yeah. I don't know if anybody has a good answer to that. I don't. I, I don't so I'm just going to make a comment on yeah. what, I, what I was seeing that stunned me was um, everyone. There's been a lot of similarities in. Uh, interesting approaches to tech, but then a big divergence on what people are applying it to. Mm -hmm. So you talk about gadgets and, right. and pieces, but then there's been chairs and, and machines that move and, and different bridge-like things that you're showing. So I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that thing because I think it's different to what sort of the architectural world where you usually have an issue that you're creating a one-off for, right? Typically you say, oh, hey, we want to do a pavilion, so you make a pavilion. Here you're sort of starting with pieces, not even a material, not like steel mm. or, or plastics or something like that. You're starting with pieces and essentially the world's your oyster. And the, the thing that I've had difficulty understanding, because we find this difficult enough, when you have all those options ahead of you, how I've, I'm hearing a lot of things related to how many, how many specialisms, do you decide to change material, the way you connect, the way they communicate, or do you put a different block? And all those choices to me seem to be, they're great to look into, but they seem to be driven by the fact that there isn't a one particular end goal because everything is achievable with particulates. So I'm just wondering if that's a problem that you've faced and do you just self-set a problem to do something? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I don't know, is this working? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if I have an answer, but I could say that uh, certainly in the world of architecture, uh, the issue of how to establish a criteria or how to evaluate what you're doing that leads to how to make decisions 
it's a big uh, question. It's always there. People that are resistant to this type of methodologies, uh, they say, but how do you decide what's best or what do you want to do? And um, actually, many people, when talking about this within our discipline, they call it like the pseudoscientific method. <laughs> and uh, so that pseudoscience doesn't seem to be acceptable or it is. And it is certainly a question of how this kind of permeates into the cultural realm and how other issues that we need to deal with are related to our methodology. So I don't, I don't know if I have a question. I think maybe those, uh, sorry, an answer, those evaluating criteria are more specific to each project. And sometimes you're just fascinated by the things that you can do without having an end goal. And sometimes you try to sort of reverse engineer or post-rationalize it or all of those things that we used to sort of kind of narrow it down and plan the next step of our investigation. So uh, yes, it's not an answer, but perhaps Good. sharing <laughs> <No>. the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I have one specific example. So has anybody seen uh, the movie Frozen? <laughs> so I, I, I want to make uh, basically a, a staircase, <laughs> a staircase that assembles itself and as you walk up it. So that, that could be, you know, maybe not out of ice, but so that's, that's sort of the kind of thing that I think could be a cool application. You know, I mean, it's, maybe it's not very practical, but it could, it would be a cool way to enter like a room or a <laughs> build your own staircase. <laughs> Well, I, th I think this is an interesting theme in this session where we started with like what we can build with laser cutters and pick and place and, and where the machine is bigger than the thing we're making and then transitioning into your talk where you're making things that are bigger than the machine by using robots. I think you kind of need that to get to there. Uh, but I think that's an exciting direction for all of like our earlier talks, which were more small. If we want to scale up, I think we need to go there. I think um, I think a big, a larger criteria is to go back to the earlier question, especially in the work of the of your distributed and modular robots, because I obviously we're obviously fans of, of that. Um, it's a question of um, uh, outside of our discipline or our shared uh, collaboration to take it into. Uh, so we do a lot of work with performance, you know, and so for the human viewer who is non-specialized. Anything moving triggers a kind of anthropomorphized uh, response. And then the, the speed at which your pieces are flipping and jumping or the speed at which your colors are changing, they all have direct impact on, on a viewer or on a kind of a shared experience. And I feel as if there isn't that much about discussion of that or perhaps it's a different domain of human-computer interaction. But I would love to see, like, you know, I mean, I would love to work with all of you, of course. To see kind of a um, uh, new knowledge produced on that. What do you mean, like in, in the kind of the limits of what you could do, or the how you should do it? How so do you see it? For example, the first time that we had uh, the dancing arms in front of, um, it wasn't even the final audience. It was we paid our our funders came in, and so as soon as they see something move, they flip out because it's the first time, or they don't know what they don't know how easy or difficult it is to make something move because they're not from here. So they just immediately project, oh, that looks quite angry. And it's beyond, you know, we don't think that a machine is angry or, or not or, or joyful because clearly it's just not part of its, its makeup. But everything is fed into that just simple mechanic, mechanical movement. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I think that's kind of what I was trying to get to. It's that, I mean, we, we, we can make stairs. I haven't watched Frozen. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we can also just you, build you them out of planks of wood and <laughs> two by fours. Um, so if we're going to make them out of programmable matter, then what's, what are the advantages of doing that? Or sure, maybe it's reusable, but so is wood. Um, and also, what would happen once you have those things too, right? It's like, that sounds super scary. You know, if you're walking up the stairs, and this thing just disappears right in front of you. Or it's, it's a beautiful moment. It <laughs> becomes an ass. It's OK as long as you're singing. Is that a hard <laughs> movie to do? Yeah. <laughs> But, but I think like what it's, re it's interesting to think about what are the mechanisms that this bits of matter are going to use to communicate what they can do and can't do, or when they're not doing something, when they're about to do something, so that we can use in the stuff to make things, right? Um, so what, what do we think about the um, disassembly that's going on that like dissolving stairs idea? Uh, because Rob, I love the, the low melting point solder dissolvable electronics. It's super awesome. And 
Paul, how do you how do you deal with disassembly afterwards or <laughs> any other approaches? Um, we do, yeah, normally as a structural engineer, I, I panic when we hear that. <laughs> 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 but, but it's actually also, and it's good to, in, in sharing, it's a good, it's a very fundamental topic right now because a lot of construction that's out there is when you crush it apart isn't inseparable things and it's a design for disassembly has become almost a sort of starting push because there's no, too late once the thing's up. Um, and and it's it's a it's a classic problem, right? Because you, you're wanting you're wanting everything at once. You're wanting something that works for you in every single way until you don't want it to. And it's not like it's supposed to know this, but you know, and so that whatever change you're putting to it or whatever energy you're putting to the system um, to make it change, in your case, you just slightly hotter water, right? Or warm water. Um, but that that ease and um, is exactly the thing that's going to define whether it even happens. We see a lot of stuff that gets trashed off the site, not because it can't be separated, but because it's difficult and it works. I have perhaps a question related to the idea of uh, material fatigue. Uh, that some of these things, like you mentioned wood, and you know, it's true that it's, the material is reusable, but there's a point where you know, it's been used too much, it stops performing like it once did, but perhaps other things don't. And I wonder this idea of also kind of a lifespan that might relate to the types of things we can do or not do, or how do we plan in relationship to this idea of life cycle uh, materials or assembly? I don't know if you have something about that. Well, the things that I've been working on are actually designed to be really rapidly uh, cycled, so assembled quickly, designed quickly, and then uh, either recycled or discarded, hopefully not discarded, but <laughs> yeah, so um, fatigue is not something that we've really been looking at very much. How about things that, you know, <laughs> continually, <laughs> and that's a classic. There's quite high strains that you're putting hinges to. Yeah. Have you ever actually had those sorts of situations? Well, like Shape Memory Alloy has a mm. definitely a limited number of folds you can get out of it. Right. So, yeah, it's a problem. I think we don't have the perfect answer to, but maybe an easy way to disassemble or melt it back down to its core and re rebuild is a good way to go. Are there any, so any uh, questions from the audience? We can take those, or we can keep rolling with. We have a couple minutes left. When we talk about assembling and a structure or a, a thing, um, we have a plan for that. And, uh, and when we talk about active matter, do we incorporate that plan when we produce the matter? Um, or do we, um, do we direct that matter in the production of the thing while it's constructing? And in either case, if, you're, if your matter has to actually perform the construction, um, maybe we're maybe we're not considering how much sensing that we, as as uh, mammalian or, or or sorry as animal species have over our entire bodies. We have a huge sensor network, and these objects, if they don't know their relationship to each other um, or their environment, can they make the right decisions? I mean, the termite the termites um, they don't have a grand vision of their termite mound, but they they sense their their area, but if you're if you want to have a discrete design, you either have to have the ability for everything to communicate and therefore coordinate, but also sense the things around them so that they can uh, choose the right way to make the thing. So I mean the the, the construction uh, coordination seemed like it was uh, a pretty complex problem to get the, the little guys to uh, coordinate on their construction. So I think that's a uh, a problem that is both related to communication and uh, sensing of the environment. Yeah, probably a lot of us are more about building and less about sensing, but <laughs> <laughs> I agree we need, to, we need to be able to sense if you want to have robotic assembly, say. That's a, that's a big part. So yeah, we, we hope to explore some of that with the, uh, with our system, because every, so every face has, of every cube has essentially a distance sensor with infrared and also ambient light sensors, so that's, hundreds of sensors, and so we, we hope to find ways to sort of use, use patterns of that, uh, of the, the data from the sensors to, to, you know, for example, use light to organize where the robots want to go or to use sort of the, the uh, sensing with the infrared to find other structures like walls and build off of them. We're definitely looking at that. 
We have one more question. Yes, I had a comment uh, pertinent to the, what was just discussed, which is I saw a presentation once about a robot which had a central body and four legs each which had knees. And uh, the robot initially had no knowledge of how it was connected, but it just randomly um, articulated itself. And after a while, it learned how to walk. And the other interesting thing about this device is that uh, if it got injured, for example, and knee stopped working, it would flail around a for a little while, but eventually learn to walk using its other legs. Wasn't that hard? Yeah, that was a full page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, one of the favorites in the lab for sure. Does anyone else has? Yeah. Hi, okay. um, I have a I have a question. Um, thanks for the talks. Um, I guess we're in a pretty tech happy tech centric um, hall today, and I'm I'm part of that. Um, but my question is a little bit about whether any of you could muse on the idea of sort of incremental applications for emergent materials and technologies. For example, if we look at, L, you know, th the, the trajectory of LEDs, you know, the holy grail uh, when the LEDs were, were first developed in the mid-90s was to get architectural lighting. But there wa they weren't powerful enough. They only came in like amber, green, and red, which is not so great, and so forth. So there was a series of incremental innovations, starting with Christmas tree gadgets, going to tail lights of cars, going to forward headlights, and so forth that created revenue, um, built the material, and kind of propagated it. And I'm wondering what those trajectories might be that this group might think for active matter. Um, I, I mean, I in my mind, I think there's, there are a couple of things that are already happening, and they're happening pretty fast. Uh, Internet of Things is one of them. I think that's a really perfect, good example of what programmable matter could do or can do or, or is already doing where everything is sort of connected, sort of talking to each other, sort of working together uh, to do things. And I think the other one is wearables, um, which is in some ways Internet of Things, but Internet of Things for your body, right? Where you're sure it might talk to your watch, which will talk to your phone, which will talk to your glasses, and that together we create this more complex behaviors and, and know what you're doing and tell you how to do things. Um, am I done? I, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Run, <laughs> run. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you make more well, I was just going to add to that. So I just, and okay. as an observation, because I think it's an excellent question. And normally, when we've seen interesting steps in technology, they've just produced toys, mm -hmm. and just as, a, and and that's great. I love toys, but then they don't seem to go to anything deeper. And, and I was interested in what I'm seeing in your work and what seems to be happening generally, is. Our, our, uh, all these sort of practical uses of things we need in our life are really better developed toys, right? Which makes us want to play with them and use them. And so, I, and so I, I'm just sharing rather than <laughs> adding. But I think that that sort of observation, because it used to dead end with toys and used to go, if that's the main thing, fine, make some money, but no real greater purpose. And it just seems as in what your stuff is toy-like, but that makes people want to, to do it. And yeah. so and I think it's the usefulness that's kicking in and is finally starting to break it out of that toy zone. Mm. Being stuck in the also, I mean, for, for Sheila's question, I think um, there's places, like certainly um, uh, discussions here, but also at other conferences, like uh, Mariana and I were just at Acadia, and there's, there's discussions about the, not the uh, kind of quantum leap that architecture must do to catch up with the rest of arts and sciences in the past 100 years, but a kind of a, a, an application. So find something that's been interesting, like, you know, you, you said modular robots are boring because they've been around for 20, 30 years. I find them fascinating. <laughs> and I simply want to see how some of it, not everything, can, like how a building can have uh, aspects of it. And even, in the, even if it's uh, for the engineers in this room, quite bland and boring to see how we do it. For me, as, a, as somebody who sees typology that can radically shift and change, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us want to build things that can fold into anything, but in the spirit of low-hanging fruit, building something that can fold a couple of things right, or change right. into a few different shapes, like, I don't know, a bicycle that can turn into a skateboard or a backpack or, you know, a few. I mean, folding bicycles are another example of something that already exists and is happening, but. 
having buildings are transformed in a couple of different ways. We have a lot one, easier. Uh, yeah. one last question there on the back, yeah. Neutrality. I mean, I think we see that happening a lot already with the, the democratization of fabrication tools, right? The, that you can just have these things in your basement uh, and they're relatively cheap, or you can build your own, or you can go to an existing fab lab and build your own tools there. I think when you have that kind of openness and accessibility, hopefully forces the surface industry to be a little bit more respectful and reasonable. All right, we should uh, really wrap it up. Do you, do you want yeah. Yeah. Kind of in the way of a comment, it seems to me that, that uh, there is already starting to be programmable matter that is going to be quite widely spread in the next couple of years, which is the automobile. The automobile has sensors, is actuators, it knows where it's going. Autonomous vehicles are essentially programmable matter. Uh, I guess the question is, what, you, what, aside from getting from A to B, can you do with that? You could do choreography. You could do uh, other kinds of things, but it's all going to be there in a consumer item uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know if anybody's thought about uh, using automobiles as programmable matter. The, I'm not sure if that answers your question but, or your comment, but I think the exciting thing to me is that, I mean, I really want to make stuff that I can't make right now, right? I have all these crazy ideas of things that one could do, but that I can. And I think that hopefully that's what programmable matter could enable, right? Allow me to think about ideas that I couldn't think before. But I think also the potentially even more exciting part is that the failures and shortcomings and, and little opportunities that these new materials create will allow people to do things that they couldn't even imagine, and then we don't know what those are yet. Um, so it doesn't quite answer what you just commented on, but but I think there's something really cool there, and I think I think we should leverage artists and designers to explore this stuff uh, by creating things that are open source, creating easy ways for people to use the stuff, understand how they work, uh, so you don't need an MIT degree to do that. Just one comment that uh, which is that. Every new technology needs a killer app. I don't right? think it does. I think I think it needs killer users. Maybe not the Terminator, but <laughs> 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 that's, that's <gotta> be, yeah. <laughs>